I'm a painter, so I've been painting my whole life. But uh, recently, last when I say recently, last 12 years, I, I've started wondering about my creativity and what makes me a painter and when I make paintings. So I've been trying to program robots to make paintings. And, and I've always had a hard time explaining why I'm doing this until I saw this portrait just made recently. And this is, this is a portrait of a, an android, uh, Erica, a Japanese android. And it was just shortlisted for the uh, Taylor Wessing Prize at the uh, National Portrait Gallery. And the reason why this is significant is because um, one of the rules of the prize is that you have to sit, it has to be a living person that has a sitting with you when you photograph them. And this is an android, of course. And a good write-up of it was, you know, this asked that question, you know, the, the theme of uncanny comes up again. Because this asks the question of perhaps the best way to think of what makes a human being, or, or, or summed up in this quote that I read, perhaps the best way to think of what makes a human being a human is to look at something that seems almost human and subtract the difference. And for me, that made perfect sense when I switched out the word human with creative. You know, I'm trying to find out what makes me creative. So if I can make my robots... The more creative I can make my robots, um, the better understanding I'll have of what makes me uniquely creative. You know, what it can't do is what makes my human creativity creative. So to get to this, I, I realized early on that uh, painting robots were the way to go. Um, and I've been building them for a while. Over the past 12 years, I've built six. I do one about every two years. And they paint with a brush on canvas. Um, but things are speeding up this year. I think, like, when I say I do two a robot every two years this year, I think I'm going to finish four. So things are ramping up just like the singularity. And uh, over the years, you know, here's a, here's a, a bunch of uh, portraits. And over the years, I've, I'm actually at over 1,000 portraits right now. So I'm constantly painting. I only have 600 databased, but I'm pretty sure I only started databasing recently. So I'm pretty sure I'm over 1,000, though I'm not certain. And you can see the... Uh, started when it started off it wasn't very creative at all you can see these early pictures of my kids um, it was basically connect the dots but you can see over the years it's getting more and more creative even to the point that now it's into abstraction and, uh, and this led me to like, led me to realize that there's probably a creative spectrum out there you know there's always this question are robots creative or not and I'm finding that's the wrong question to ask it's more like there's probably there's there's several levels of creativity and the question to ask is, where are robots on these levels of creativity? So where are they at? Like, you would say a high artist like Picasso is about as creative as you can get. Um, but also then, on the other scale, you might have portrait artists. And sometimes I'm asked to make a portrait and, and the, that one simple task, make this portrait look like a human being that I'm painting, that's not really that creative. So I've come up with this idea that um, there's probably a spectrum. It's not my idea. A lot of people think there's probably a spectrum. And at the far, at the low end, you might have connect the dots, paint by numbers, stuff I did in the early years while I was still figuring it out, uh, maybe stroke techniques. But then, uh, then, and then there's like a step where you get a little beyond the technical, where you're at the, uh, you start introducing random elements. Um, like in these, in the, one of the early ones there of my nephew, I, uh, I'd have the robot fill in the composition. Something that I was just talking about with Andrew today, kids do this really well. When they want to draw, they just fill in compositions almost randomly. There's those, there are also uh, things here where such as like I'd split the face from the background and do random abstract stuff in the background to make complex compositions. And there's also, um, the, I think one of my favorite things that ever happens, I realized that these robots were just printers unless they had feedback loops. And what I mean by feedback loops is I started having my pr uh, robots look at what they were doing and then make random brush strokes, but they weren't completely random. They would take a look at the uh, brush strokes and compare it to what they were trying to paint. And that's what you have in this painting here, where it, it paint a little compared to what it was trying to paint, take a picture, it'd do some algorithms to see is this coming out good, change it up a little. But opposite to a printer, where if a printer runs out of cyan ink and it just keeps on printing, you gotta have, you gotta have this feedback so that you can at least, it's random, but heading somewhere. And then, uh, about after this, I started realizing that there's, beyond just randomness, there's imitation where the robots get smart enough to imitate. And I had this crowdsourcing project similar to Ken's Telegarden, where anyone can get on my robots and paint. And while, the, while you would paint by swiping your finger on a tablet, the robot would watch you and imitate. And it would start learning from you. And that's how that George Washington was done. Um, a couple other things. This is a painting of my wife and daughter, where crowdsource, robots doing its best to learn what you're doing using those feedback loops. I'll, show you, I'll tell you more about the feedback loops. 
and basically combining as many approaches as possible into, uh, into making art. But it's still imitation. And then this is recent. And this isn't my work that's done this. It, well, I've incorporated this work into my robots, but it's stuff I'm learning from deep learning, and what other people have done with deep learning that I think that we've actually gone from imitation in the last year or two to creation, where robots are actually being creative. And I'm not saying they're making art yet, but I do think that we're at the, we're at the point where they're being creative. And there's lots of arguments that are evident, or there's a lot of evidence of this, and I'll show it to you. And like, for me, for example, is I, I, these paintings, all the artistic directions done by the robots. So I make no decisions. And I'll go into details in that in a second. Uh, it makes all the aesthetic decisions. and actually makes meaningful abstraction. Like, uh, and what I mean by meaningful abstractions, anyone in this room could go get a Roomba, put a paintbrush on it, and make an abstract artwork, but it's not meaningful. One of the reasons I chose portraits is because it has this limitation where you want to make it abstract, but it still has, got to, it's, it has to have that rule of getting that likeness. And so we're getting likeness, but these robots are coming up with unique compositions, unique styles, and uh, that's where we're at. I think this is where we're at. It's, it's debatable. But so that brings up the question of what's left beyond these abstract paintings. I'm going to show you at the end. I'm going to go into details right now about how all the algorithms that go into my robots, and I'll show you some paintings. I'm like, can we do this actually with some modern, uh, or I shouldn't say some famous pieces of artwork. So here's my current process. Um, I start with a painting, and this is the one part that is still human done. The top left-hand corner is a painting by my son. And then I take a, a series of photographs where I have my robots watch the room, and when someone walks in front of it, just start taking photos, like a photo shoot. And then I, I use a lot of algorithms, mostly OpenCV, to reduce those pictures down to something that is aesthetically pleasing. I have a lot of different algorithms I've used over the years. Uh, but then we come up with this photo, and then I apply style transfer, which is, you know, was it Gaddy's, Eckers, and Bethke of Bethke Labs came up with it two years ago. It's just this amazing application of deep learning where you can take a photo and then a source image, and you can paint that photo in the style of that source image. Most of your guys like Prisma apps. If you guys are using apps on Facebook, it's using style transfer. So it comes up with this image, and then um, I send it. I have a historic database of brush strokes. Here's another view of it where I just described all the way up to style transfer. And I have a historic database of brush strokes where, I've, like I was telling you, I have 600 paintings in my database. I'll look for something that's similar that's been done in the past and maybe get the color from there, the stroke geometry. And it's trying to learn and add and create a new painting. And here you can see two things. You can see the style transfer being applied, and then you can see the painting being built up brush stroke by brush stroke. Uh, to break it down into the things, it first decides what to paint, how to paint, and then does that feedback loop where it's constantly seeing what it's doing and trying to readjust uh, to make it better and better until it decides that it's finished. And that's an interesting thing when I say it decides that it's finished. An I guess you could say an algorithm that I wrote decides that it's finished. But it's interesting nonetheless because uh, what's happening is it keeps on trying to compare to what it's trying to paint to what it's painted. And, and there comes a point where the delta, the difference, doesn't increase anymore or it doesn't decrease anymore. It, it can't optimize. And at that point, the, my robot decides I can't paint this any more better or I can't paint this any better. Any better and it stops. So I already went through this, so I don't know if I need to go through it again real quick, but gets a collection of image, applies a style transfer, how to paint. Uh, and here's two things where you can actually see the, uh, two paintings where you can actually see the uh, delta of the difference, and it's just painting the difference away in both of them, both using a whole series of different algorithms. So as far as this has gotten, and I think it's actually, I think it's neat, but uh, there's lots of problems. And there's three main problems. And this is like, this will reveal the thresholds, like how far is, computational creativity compared to human creativity. The first is, you know, I showed you, well, creativity is not two phases in your process. Second is deep learning needs context. And the third, so obvious, I feel silly mentioning it. machines are emotionally clueless. But let's hit the first. Uh, this is my process as I just described. And, uh, and this is not really that good a description of creativity compared to this. And this isn't even a good description of creativity. But you saw in the other one, you know, I just like, I've already decided what to paint, and I never change it, no matter what happens on the canvas. If any of you are painters out there, you would realize it's like, you might start painting something and then decide halfway through the painting you don't want to paint that picture of a portrait anymore, you want to paint a dog. So there should be feedback loops, 
at every level, including what you're being inspired from, you know, whether you're being inspired by a Picasso and halfway through you're like, I need to use more primaries and you switch to Modrian. Uh, Mondrian. And so there should be feedback loops at every level. You should like halfway through, you might want to switch your source photograph. You might want to switch your style that you're using for the style transfer. So that's one big problem. And, and I'm, I got answers, but I don't have meaningful answers yet. Like I, I, I can simulate this, but it's not meaningfully. You know, I, still working on it. And the other is the context of deep learning and style transfer. And I don't know everyone's levels here on, on deep learning, so uh, uh, I'll just go from the basic levels. Like I described, you take a source image, you take a photograph, and you can, or a style image, I'm sorry, source image and a content image, and you apply the source image to the content image, and you can just apply these styles. Here's another example, two paintings by my kids, me and my son. And you can see where it fails. Where it fails is if you look at the first picture on the top there, the dots are in the background, but when it applies the style, it's applying the dots to my face, right? It should stay in the background, and the face should have the black lines. And, and I wouldn't call this style transfer, and I hate, to, I hate criticizing this algorithm because I love it. It's changed everything for me. So, so this is a loving criticism of the algorithm. When I say it's not style transfer, it's more like color and texture transfer, if that makes sense. Um, and what I mean by that is, it's capturing really well the, the color and the texture, but it's not really the style. And I'll use this example to show what I mean by style. It's like it's, it's applying the screen to a picture of my son in San Francisco, but you would expect that the sky would look like the screen sky, but it doesn't. You'd also expect that the ground looks like the ground in the screen, but it doesn't, and my son's face is completely wiped up. So it did a really good job of transferring the texture and color, but not really the style of Munch. Um, and so a lot of people have actually already thought of this problem. I, I started working on it and I realized after reading about it that other people have been concerned about this and a better application would be regional style transfer where if you see a source image in a target photo, you compare the regions. Like you would paint the clouds in this image the same way you would paint the cloud, or you would take the cloud, how the clouds were painted, apply it to the photo. And so when you take that principle, you can see the difference right here. Um, the, first, uh, the top one, of course, is you know, without considering the regions. And the bottom one, everything's in, in, when you have a map of the different areas, it makes a lot more sense. The sky looks like the scream sky. The ground looks like the screams ground. Uh, the man-made bridge, similar colors and texture to the man-made bridge. So you would think that this is hard to do, but it's already solved. Um, a lot of people have solved it a lot of different ways. Abrut forced it in OpenCV by uh, taking the tiles and by a complex manner, you can just do a lot of object recognition, image rec OpenCV has really good facial recognition software. So I look at the tiles, zero in on the faces, and then I have that region. A more elegant way, but way more complex, is uh, convolutional neural networks. Same, these are the same neural networks that were used for uh, style transfer, but they have a different application. And when you drop an image into Google, or if you go into Facebook and type uh, something and you type like table, all the pictures of you with the table and it will appear. These are, uh, this is that, it's a convolutional neural network. And I don't know how much detail I want to go into, but I'll break it down and I can answer questions afterwards. But it starts by breaking, some ways of doing it, it starts by breaking the tiles down, applying a convolution. These are like, these are filters like emboss, uh, edge detect, uh, Gaussian blurs, box blurs. And then, it, and then it downsamples, and that's really important to uh, convolutional neural networks. You always downsample, and you can see this case I use max pooling, and then you repeat it. You do a second uh, convolution, a second downsample, put it into a fully connected layer, we'll do perceptron, and then depending on what data you trained this uh, neural network on, you'll get an answer. In this case, 65% chance that's a bridge. So you know, you know, when you put it together, you know what you have in the different areas, and you can see my this is my brute force, sloppy way of finding context in the photos that I can now use to apply style transfer. But other people have much better algorithms that I mean are really amazing. I don't know how this person can find a person on a horse or how this algorithm finds a person on a horse, but it doesn't, does it well. And these are all open source, Google Vision API. Uh, you can either write your own or save a lot of time and go use Google Vision or something similar. So, so that's sort of solved, right? Because we have style transfer, which, which TensorFlow gives away for free. We have these, um, this context. So now you can do this regional style transfer uh, that makes much more me meaningful abstraction. So we have complex feedback loops, I'm suggesting, regional style transfer. And that brings us to the fact that machines are clueless. Um, and so 
what do I mean by, I'm, I feel silly even saying that. Uh, the machines can experiment and create random things, but it's unclear if they can evaluate their experimentation to determine if it produced meaningful art or emotional relevance. So we can look, I was going to end up by looking at these three artworks and talking about can they be done with the state of art. Can you get something very similar to these. The first is uh, Study of Velazquez's Portrait of Pope Innocent X by Francis Bacon. You have Self-Portrait with Bandage Year by, of course, Vincent Van Gogh. And then you have Lick and Lather by Janine Antoni. And that's, you know, I brought a sculpture in to show this doesn't really, you know, art, just because I like to work with painting portraits, art's not limited to that. And what's interesting about that is, uh, you guys probably know a lot about the first two, but this, this one is not obvious. The, uh, the six portraits, the six busts in the backs are made, with, are, are uh, sculpted out of uh, soap, and the six in the foreground are, are sculpted out of chocolate. So this is about self-image issues. Uh, this artist had self-image issues, and and very intentionally picked soap and chocolate uh, as the medium by which they make these sculptures. And that, to me, is high art. That's really interesting. Uh, can a robot do it, right? So let's hit the first one. And I'm going to jump ahead and say, I think we're at the point where Francis Bacon, uh, study of Velasquez, corporate Pope, and Synth the X, is in the realm of artificial creativity. Uh, there's GANs and CANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. And now, just a couple of months ago, Creative Adversarial Networks, um, and these are the papers. This one, I think, was just released in, in, in a conference in Georgia about computational creativity. So, so it lets, I'll give you a quick, not too much detail, uh, synopsis of general adversarial networks if you don't understand them or know them. But the CNNs I told you were one neural network. This is a pair of neural networks, a generator and a discriminator. And they're, they're in a game against each other. The best way I heard it described is that they're, they're fighting each other, trying to fool each other. So the generator is trying to create, in this case, faces. And it starts so by making just random noise. The discriminator is trained on what a face looks like. And it's constantly, whenever it gets the input from the generator, it says, are these faces? And then it gives a response, nope, not a face. But it also gives the data of why it didn't think it was a face. And that helps tra train the generator better. And then I don't know if this is the laser. Well, I don't know if I need a laser. But then the generator tries again thousands of times. A uh, discriminator makes a decision, face or not, tells the generator why. Generator tries again, and it gets better and better. And over the course of this is on my home computer, over the course of two or three hours, uh, all the faces on the right get generated. All completely fabricated, all completely made up. Uh, those faces don't exist. Maybe people out there look like them, but those were just made out of statistics. So this is, you know, that's the generative adversarial network. That's a, a GAN I've written. Here's a GAN I have not written, but I'm aware of. And it's where someone's taken this idea and set of faces. He's training a GAN with art. And that is actual artwork that has come out of this GAN. And, um, and then we go to CANs, Creative Adversarial Networks, which is the same as a GAN, but a little bit different. There's this idea of style ambiguity is added. And this is to emphasize the fact that I want you to make art, but I want it to be a little different. I want the style to be different from anything that exists. And if you ask me, half the pictures on the right there are created by artists. Uh, the other half are created by a machine. I, I can't tell the difference. So if this was some sort of artistic Turing test, this has gone into completely new styles. Um, is it meaningful new styles? I don't know. Uh, but when you ask the question of whether or not the study of Velasco's portrait of Pope Innocent the Tenth belongs or can be created by artificial creativity, I'm going to argue yes, because he was basically just taking the portrait of Pope Innocent the Tenth by Velasquez and applying a new style to it. Um, controversial, but I, that's where I feel right now. And that brings us to these last two examples. And this is where I think it ends. You know, if I had to say, how, where's the threshold? Um, nothing technical about this Van Gogh that a robot couldn't do. You could paint this out, but you know what's unique about this Van Gogh? He's self-mutilated, or he's cut off his ear. There's been self-mutilation, and he did a self-portrait after. And uh, I don't think robots are there yet, right? I mean, obviously, without emotional context. And the other one's even more interesting: is that to create something out of soap and chocolate because of self-image issues is that is so abstract and so conceptual that it, I even have, I mean, we all have to think about it for a second, whether or not that's meaningful. And so this is, so I don't even know what to say at this point. I, I think I'll just end it there, is that this is where I think we're at. It's a lot further than I realized at the beginning of this year. 
Um, still a long way to go, but uh, robots are getting closer and closer. Thank you.